Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode. We're back of Orange Weekly, presented by Krause Health. Uh, a lot of ways you can watch the show. Maybe you're watching live right now on Syracuse Orange Football's Facebook page. We have turned down the basketball page because, yes, we have basketball to talk about. Exhibition basketball, but basketball to talk about. We're also live on Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube. If you missed the show live, uh, you can always catch the YouTube replay. We put it out on our social media channels. It automatically archives right here on Facebook. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, we put a post up on Syracuse.com as well. So a lot of easy ways to catch up if you do miss the show live. Hop in that comment section, fire off some questions, some comments, some commentary on what you're seeing about football. The Orange coming off that loss to Clemson, but another sold out. JMA Wireless Dome this weekend as Syracuse gets ready for the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame, right? We got basketball to talk about, as mentioned, and uh, happy to uh, respond to your comments and questions. And uh, you guys always uh, bring some good stuff to the table here. Uh, big day in central New York. POTUS is visiting uh, briefly, albeit I did not see any uh, betting wagers on whether or not uh, President Biden will be wearing an orange tie or not. Uh, when he comes to Syracuse, but uh, one would imagine uh, he would. He's only going to be here for a few hours. I don't know if he's going to get a chance to talk to the football team or not, or uh, visit Syracuse University or his old house here in central New York, a big event going on with uh, Micron Technologies, a major investment they're making here in central New York in the coming years. A really good news for the area, by the way, for those of you that like to keep tabs on what's cooking here in central New York, as we get uh, viewers all over the place on this show. So, uh, a lot of happening here in Central New York today, and a lot happening with football. Let's start there with uh, Syracuse and Notre Dame coming up. Uh, but one last look back on Clemson. Obviously, Sean Tucker did not get the football enough last week. Obviously, there were those plays on the sidelines. We talked about it a little bit uh, last week. Um, as David says right here, we got robbed last weekend, but we'll beat the Dame. Look, there was no question. Jennifer excited. Her president's gonna. Uh, her husband's gonna be there with the president today. Very exciting news. Uh, listen, the sideline plays were bogus, both of them. Okay, Elijah Fuentes Conta for Syracuse was pushed into uh, Cape Klubnik, the Clemson quarterback. Right? They didn't call it on Garrett Trader. That's just dumb. Like you just got to make that call. Right? Didn't happen. Sean Tucker only got the ball five times, which is inexplicable. But to his credit, Dino Babers came to his press conference Monday, and he owned both of those things. If you guys didn't see the presser, I wrote a column about it, too. I'd, uh, let, I would really enjoy it if you guys uh, read that column. But watch the presser, because Dino owned it. He said there was no excuse for Tucker not to get the ball more. He talked about the penalties, which can get you in trouble. And if the ACC had fined Babers, John Wildhack should come in the room and put a blank check on the table and say, just fill in the amount because it would have been worth the criticism. And he also uh, took ownership for the timeout gaffe at the end of the game. Now, Syracuse ultimately almost won that game anyway. I shouldn't say they almost won, but they were driving down the field. Tuck or uh, Schrader, pardon me, through an interception. They got inside the 20 yard line. So even with the time shortened, but it's inexcusable for a coach to continue to have these time gaffes, time management issues, right? So I like that Dino owned it. And talking to the players on Tuesday, look, they're going to tell us what we want to hear in a sense, but I really do think this team has turned the page. They are hyper-focused on Notre Dame to have this home crowd, another sold-out crowd. I can't remember the last time there was a back-to-back -back JMA wireless dome sold-out carrier dome back in the day. I want to say 92 maybe is the last time that happened. That's a good stat to look up. But doesn't happen often, for sure. And look, Notre Dame is not what Notre Dame usually is. But the intriguing thing about playing a team like Notre Dame is it doesn't matter what their record is. It doesn't matter that they're not what they were, uh, not only history-wise, but even in recent years. A team that you know was right there in the conversation or and literally in the college football playoff, right? It's great that Notre Dame's coming here. It's not at Yankee Stadium. It's not at MetLife Stadium. You know, you go to South Bend. That's part of the deal, right, to trade locations. But they have farmed this game off, first time since 2003, that Notre Dame is coming here. And look, if you remember that game, Walter Reyes, five touchdowns on the day. Syracuse rolled Notre Dame as uh, Paul Pasqualoni's tenure was uh, coming to an end. That wasn't his last season. It was the second to last season. That was a great day. I remember that day 
distinctly and, and Walter Reyes and his huge performance. And not that I'm expecting Sean Tucker to do the same because Notre Dame's got a terrific defensive line, terrific defensive line. But this is a, a Notre Dame team that's been struggling on offense this year. And you know, I've talked to a couple of people this week about Notre Dame that cover the team. And certainly you guys have seen it this year. Now they come into this game, a couple of interesting stats. Notre Dame is 38 and nine against the ACC since 2014. And they have not lost to a team other than Clemson since 2017. However, Notre Dame is seven and five against ranked ACC teams in that stretch. And they get Syracuse this week, who's number 16. They get Clemson in two weeks after that, right? You've got a quarterback in Drew Pine, who's won four or five as the Irish starter. But his last two games, 360 yards combined, three touchdowns and a pick. He's only completing the ball at a 50% percentage rate. Last week against UNLV, it was one of 10 for 37 yards on third and fourth down. There's already calls in South Bend for their freshman quarterback, Steve Angeli, to get in there a little bit. They've got a three-headed monster at running back and Logan Diggs, Audric Estime, and a Chris Tyree. Uh, Estime right now is having a bit of a fumble issue. He leads that team with six touchdowns. The thing with Notre Dame you got to watch is their tight end, Michael Mayer. What's going to be interesting about this is, you know, Syracuse has a Ronde Gatson, right? And Gatson has been awesome this year. He's up there amongst leaders in the ACC and touchdown catches. I don't even consider him a tight end anymore. He's more like a hybrid slash receiver. I mean, call him what you want. Michael Mayer is a true tight end. He's probably the best tight end in the country. He is going to be uh, featured heavily in that Notre Dame offense. You could double team this guy. He still makes catches. He is one heck of a player. He's Uncle Brent's dream, frankly. I mean, I've been calling for Syracuse to recruit this kind of player, throw to the tight end more. And again, Gatson has filled that uh, role this year, but I don't even consider him a tight end anymore. We mentioned how good their defense is. They've got a, a top rate first round NFL draft pick on that defensive line who also made a, a lot of plays on special teams last week, Isaiah Foskey, who had two block punts last week. But the thing with the Notre Dame defense that's been interesting this year, they actually have more block punts than they do takeaways. They only have three takeaways this year. So look, Notre Dame is always going to have, as Dino Babers would say, the rhinos, the hippos, the elephants on the offensive and defensive line. It is going to be more difficult for Syracuse to run the ball on Notre Dame. But, man, you you are certainly going to see more Sean Tucker in this football game, and we'll see if that proves to be uh, what the missing ingredient was last week. He was averaging 10 yards a carry against a really good Clemson defensive line a week ago. So how Syracuse utilizes uh, Tucker this week and mixes things up on offense is going to be important. Allison jumping in, saying the Tucker looked banged up at the Clemson game. I wonder if that's why he didn't get too many carries. Speaking of banged up, do we know anything regarding the status of SU's injured players? Uh, I'll answer the second part first. Uh, the second part first, Allison. No, we don't, unfortunately, because injury news has gotten real tight around Syracuse. Dino Babers has, uh, uh, as he likes to say, he's going to take the pitch on that question. He's been real tight-lipped about injury news. The good news there with Tucker, though, is he is healthy. He is healthy, according to him. He tweeted that out Sunday night in his uh, tweet that everybody waits for, right? The famous Sean Tucker tweets. We talked to him this week. Uh, by all accounts, he's healthy. Dino even admitted he's healthy. Um, he definitely was banged up the last few weeks and has been banged up all year, but I think he's as healthy as can be. And for a player to put that out there, he even said in his Tuesday media session that he tweeted that and told us that on Tuesday, just to kind of put anything to rest about injury being a factor and why he only got five carries in that game. That was coach's decision. That was coach's decision. I think Garrett Schrader kept the ball too much when, you know, Schrader's got some freedom in this offense and RPO situations, run pass option, or, you know, called plays. They saw something in that Clemson defense where a running quarterback could have success. Jordan Travis for Florida State ran all over Clemson the week before. So I get that, but you cannot justify Garrett Schrader having 21 carries and Tucker only having five. So hopefully that gap uh, closes in this week and Syracuse gets a little creative on offense. And that's a, the other thing I wanted to address. As good as Gadsden's been, and I asked Dino Babers about this this week, and his answer was, I can't wait to see a second receiver emerge who's worthy of that title. Now, I think Devon Cooper is the first answer to that question. You know, Jim jumps right in while, right while we're talking about it, Jim. Courtney Jackson not getting many targets this year. And I am surprised. 
I feel like Schrader is not seeing these guys. Okay. I feel like he's locked so locked in on Gatson that what Schrader does is he looks for Gatson. And if Gatson's not open, he runs. Cooper's been open. Courtney Jackson's been open. Certainly Damian Alford's got that one or two plays a game where he makes a big catch. He had the big catch on the sideline. Alford's probably the closest thing this team has to a number two receiver at this point. But look at the numbers from last week. So Gadsden had eight catches for 86 yards last week. You combine the other four players that caught passes for Syracuse. I think it, and I'd have to double check my notes, but I think it added up to about 79 yards. So it's a conundrum, right? Because Gadsden's open and he's a great player. And even through double teams, he's getting open. And I would certainly anticipate that more teams are just going to throw everything they have at this guy and make you go the other way. But there are players open that Gatson, or pardon me, that Schrader has to find and not just lock in on Gatson. So I think that's a step forward for this offense. More Tucker, of course. Look, I, I have no complaints about this defense. What more can you ask a team to do and get four takeaways like they did last week? And the quarterback getting knocked out of the Syracuse Clemson game has been an interesting storyline. It happened in 2017 when Syracuse pulled the upset. It happened in 2018 when Syracuse almost pulled the upset. This time, DJ Uwe Ungale didn't get hurt. He got knocked out because he was ineffective because he had four takeaways, right? Cape Klubnik comes in and, and leads Clemson back. And uh, I haven't really checked on how things are going with Clemson this week. I don't know if they consider it a, a quarterback controversy at this point, if Kludnick's going to start, if DJ's going to start. I think they're probably going to ride out DJ a little bit more before they make that permanent change. But in that game, he got knocked out because the Syracuse defense knocked him out. I anticipate that's what's going to win Syracuse this game. Is Drew Pine is, is going to get flustered. I think Syracuse is going to have two or three takeaways in this game. Notre Dame should be able to run the ball somewhat effectively, but they just don't have a dynamic enough offense. I know they put up 44 against UNLV last week. I mean, UNLV is, you know, I wouldn't consider that a good litmus test for a good football team, you know, that's on the level of Syracuse. And what's interesting, guys, is Jennifer jumps in there. There you go. Answers my question. Appreciate that, Jennifer. DJ is back as the starter at Clemson, and I would think so. I think you, you ride that out a little longer before you make that change, particularly with Klubnik being a freshman at this point. Uh, Greg says, I've noticed that Schrader, while much improved, seems to focus on a single receiver, but at Clemson, he seemed to have improved there. I hope so, Greg. Um, he's got to do that. He's got to go through his progressions, but I think his instinct when Gatson is an open is to take off and run, and I feel like he's he's effective there. He can make some, some chunk plays for Syracuse there, but I think if Syracuse is going to maintain this through the second half of the season, he's got to become more of a quarterback in that you, you go through your progressions and you throw the football, right? Running quarterbacks are huge in football these days. Like I'm a Bills fan, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, go through them. It's a weapon. You got to use it. And Schrader is, is tough to bring down. He's quick. And that's a weapon, right? When you have an Eric Dungy type, I think that's what makes this offense flow best. So I'm not saying he's got to, you know, uh, put a chair in, in the pocket and sit in it. But I, I think his instinct is gats and run. It's got to be Gatson, Cooper, Jackson, then run, right? Go through those progressions a little quicker. And I think having a quarterback coach like Jason Beck uh, really, really helps that, okay? Um, so I feel like ultimately Syracuse is the better team here, and I feel like they have the upper hand for once. Usually when Syracuse plays Notre Dame, Notre Dame's the higher-ranked team. They're not even ranked. Notre Dame certainly has some NFL-level talent, but Syracuse can match that. Uh, if not exceed that, in, in some cases, Syracuse is the better quarterback. They have the star running back. Again, Notre Dame's got a good running game, but I would take Tucker over those guys. And you got the crowd on your side. Again, got to take advantage of that because the penalties were just terrible. Again, last week, put aside the bad call on the sidelines. Syracuse had 10 penalties in Death Valley. And that wasn't the home cooking from the refs. Those were procedure calls. Those were offsides. Those were holding. That's where there was a pass interference on Johnson. I think you could have gone either way on, but a, a majority of those penalties were earned and they were on the orange and that cannot continue, especially when we got the home crowd on your side this week. So our predictions are up on Syracuse.com. I saw somebody earlier saying, what's up with Nate, our boy, Nate Mink. Is he just doing the, the, uh, the, there it is. Blake's like, what's up with Nate? 
Doesn't look like he has confidence in the Orange this year. Yeah, what's up with you, Nate? Our boy, Nate Mink. I think Nate likes to uh, be the contrarian sometimes because both Emily and I pick Syracuse to win, and you know, Nate likes to go the other way uh, just to just to be Mr. Contrarian. But I wouldn't be stunned if they lost this game. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be stunned. I mean, that's just college football and everything. But I would be surprised if that makes any sense, right, because of all the factors we mentioned. So I've got Syracuse winning this one. I think I said 31-20 was my score. I even for, forget what the score was that I uh, put in the in uh, on our predictions today. But I do think Syracuse wins, gets back on track. And then uh, Pittsburgh after that, and a lot more games on the road on the back end for Syracuse here. So a couple more comments from you. Then we're going to switch up the basketball, guys, to get those basketball comments ready. Allison thinks the offensive line blew some assignments that caused Schrader to get clobbered. Can't afford that. Brian says, great defense. Nice improvement on Schrader. Not sure why Tucker underused or if keyed on by others. Uh, Syracuse needs turnovers and a solid defense with a smart offense, more discipline on penalties, and better clock management. All well said there, Brian. Okay, you guys can keep the football comments going in the uh, in the comments section here, and I'll highlight them here, but I'm going to switch to basketball a little bit. Uh, it's one game. It's one exhibition game, right? But – I think there's a lot you can take away from that exhibition game that Syracuse played against Indiana of Pennsylvania a couple nights ago. And I'll say this, guys, for what it's worth. Indiana PA is one of the best programs in Division II. They're, they have national championship aspirations at that level. I think that's a nice test that Jim Beheim scheduled. You don't want to bring in somebody that's going to beat you. You don't want it, which they almost did. Uh, you don't want another LeMoyne situation on your hands, but you want a challenge that these players will improve from even in exhibition play. I feel like we're going to have to crank up the patience on this team. It is a interesting mix of returning players like Joe Girard, Jesse Edwards, Benny Williams, who looked great in that game. I think Benny is going to be one of the most improved players in the ACC this year. He's going to be terrific around the basket. He brings a rebounding element to the table that this team needs. Uh, he's back. Samir Torrance is back. Now you mix in all the freshmen. Judah Mintz, who is going to get a lot of run at point guard. You've got Justin Taylor coming off the bench. You have Chris Bell, formerly known as Chris Bunch. He changed his name to Chris Bell. Uh, Donna DeToyer wrote a story about that this week. If you guys want to check that out, you got Malik Brown coming in. I love what I saw from Kadir Copeland. Just brings a real pop and an energy and a confidence. He's a hybrid player. He can play the two. He can play the three, right? I shouldn't say the two. He can play point guard or the three, right? You got a few guys on this team that can play multiple positions, right? But, man, we're going to have to be patient with some of these young guys. I like that there is an element that if Judah Mintz does struggle, that Symeer Torrance can come in and, you know, settle the offense down, run the offense. He's not an offensive-minded player. He can get to the basket better, and he made some real improvement on offense at the end of last season. But he's not a scorer, right? Putting Joe at the two, I think, is going to be a blessing and a curse. And here's what I mean by that. Joe's the only true three-point shooter on this team that we know about right now. Now, I've heard good things about Justin Taylor, but he's got to do it at this level. It's There's spots where you have players that can hit threes, but this is not a team like last year. Last year had a bunch of three-point shooters. Joe is the only consistent three-point shooter we know about at this point. Now, all these guys love to shoot threes. It's part of the game these days, but who emerges as a true three-point threat other than Joe Girard, is going to be something to watch because teams are going to throw doubles at Joe. They're going to face guard him. They're going to get on him, knowing that he's on the two, there to shoot, doesn't have to run the point anymore, and he's the primary scorer from the outside. That being said, I think Syracuse has, has more players that are better around the basket. We mentioned Benny. I think Judah Mintz, just from what I've seen so far, and Jim Beheim has been really high on him, get to the basket. When Simeon's in, he can get to the basket, right? Jesse Edwards, of course. You know, I think there's going to be times this year um, when Syracuse should just flat out run their offense through Jesse Edwards. Yeah, Jim Beheim said at media day that that's what cost Syracuse at the end of last season. I don't think that team was going to make the tournament regardless, but when Jesse went down, that just kind of sunk their battleship. I mean, they had a great uh, breakout in the ACC tournament and went down with a fight, no question about it. Right. But 
Jesse was a game breaker. There's no question about that. Not a tournament game breaker, but I think you run the offense through him a little bit more this year. His improvement's going to be there. But I think Jim made some interesting comments at his press conference that Jesse was still in Europe, right? Because he played for Amsterdam uh, over the summer and, and for Europe basketball, and it's a different thing. And he had, kind of has to get out of that mentality, right? So, but Jesse, I think is, you know, he would have uh, been one of the most, uh, would have probably literally won the most improved player in the ACC last year if he didn't get hurt. And uh, certainly is going to be an anchor on this team this year, but it's a lot of new guys filling in new roles. The first half of that game, that ex only an exhibition game, and you have a little bit of room to experiment, but you know, Jim played 11 guys. Now I think ultimately he's going to settle in on his usual seven or eight guy rotation. They did play some man-to-man. -man. I highlighted the comment there from Rob. It's not going to be the primary defense, but they're going to play it because it makes sense for this team to play it. When you have three guards in there, when you have certain lineups that are out there, it makes a heck of a lot more sense to play man-to-man -man defense. It's interesting. Jim Beheim said that it's tougher to teach this team man-to-man. -man. People think man-to-man -man is simple. There's number 12. Go guard them. But there, it is a little more complicated than that. He actually says the basics and the fundamentals – of the zone defense are easier to teach than the than man to man. They do work on man to man a lot, and I know this sounds like a Halloween ghost story that Syracuse is going to be playing man to man defense this year. But we saw it on Tuesday. We're going to continue to see it. Where the balance ends up is, you know, anybody's guess at this point. But I I think it's safe to say we're going to see more man to man defense at this point than we've seen in a while for Syracuse. Right. Where'd Brent go? He's behind the comment. You guys see me? I'm playing hide and seek. Where'd I go? Where'd I go? Nice comment there from Kevin, though, going through a lot of things uh, on the football team as we continue to do that. Brian asked, is Benny similar to uh, Grant at this stage? Big upside. And when all else fails, rebound, rebound, rebound. I think that's a great way to put it, Brian. You know, Jeremy came in, skinny guy. He's kind of getting pushed around for a while and just got better. The athleticism, I think Jeremy was a much more athletic player than Benny Williams. Not that Benny doesn't have athleticism, but Jeremy's athleticism just popped off the screen. He leaves early. I remember how skeptical Bayheim was about that. I remember sitting in his office talking to him about it for a story that I was writing. And now Jeremy Grant is the best Syracuse player in the NBA right now. I mean, he had a great game-winning shot for Portland just the other night. He got traded to Portland. Or was, it, was he a free agent? I can't remember. But now he's on Portland. And uh, he's the best Syracuse player in the NBA. And that's not to take away from Carmelo Anthony. I'm just saying right now, right now, in terms of all things considered, who is the, the best talent that Syracuse has in the NBA? It's Jeremy Grant, right? So that's the kind of player he developed into. Can Benny Williams go down that path? What you said, Brian, is spot on. Rebound, rebound, rebound. Second chances. Give somebody uh, a player around the basket. Uh, he's much bigger than he was last year, and he's, He's going to need that because he's going to play more. He's got to go through the rigors of an ACC schedule. I think that's key with this team this year, too, guys. I'm curious to see how it goes because you have so many young players. But we even saw it coming before they got into the throes of the season last year. That non-conference schedule was brutal. It was brutal. You had the battle for Atlantis, three good teams that they played there, Auburn included who had one of the best players in the country. You had Indiana in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Georgetown sniped them last year, right? Um, you know, I'll go back and look at it here while we're talking about it, just, just to revisit it. But with how the NCAA tournament has made non-conference play a much bigger conversation, the quad system, and they want to know who you played outside your conference. So you can't just say, well, look what we did in the ACC, the toughest conference in college basketball. Right. So let's go through it. Colgate beat Syracuse last year, which was an early sign of just how poor that defense was. And that's really what sunk their battleship more than anything last year was their poor defense. They give up 75 points a game. So Colgate beat you. You go to the Battle of Atlantis, you lose two or three. You, now they beat Indiana. That was an epic two overtime game at the Dome. Let's not forget. Go to Florida State and win after that. So you're starting to think, OK, maybe they've righted the ship a little bit. But then they lose to Villanova. They lose by four at Georgetown, right? Go through it, and then next thing you know, you're an ACC player. So I think the signs were there 
in a few games that they lost and they got so behind in non-conference play that it was tough to come out of that. Okay, let's compare that to this year. Give me a sec just to pull up this year's schedule. On paper, it looks easier. But will this schedule be the equivalent in difficulty because you have so many new players, right? You had some experienced players out there with a tough schedule. This year, it's a mix of experience. And uh, as they said, and in, in my cousin Vinny, a lot of Utes, a lot of Utes out there for Syracuse. Uh, Lehigh to start off, Colgate. I don't think they're going to beat Syracuse two years in a row, but you know you can't look past them. Northeastern is certainly a game Syracuse should win. Uh, a rematch with the mighty Richmond Spiders at the Barclays Center followed by either St. John's or Temple. So at the very least, you want to go 2-0 and there, if, if not split there. Bryant, featuring uh, Charles Pride, former uh, Syracuse stud, coming back on the 26th. Illinois is the ACC Big Ten Challenge game this year. That's at Illinois this year. Um, not easy, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Syracuse won. You get an early ACC game against Notre Dame. Oakland, which has had some good teams, some tournament teams in recent years. Georgetown comes to the Dome this year. A quick turnaround to play Monmouth, Cornell, and then early start to ACC play this year. December 20th against Pitt. Then you got Boston College on New Year's Eve, Louisville on January 3rd, and into ACC play you go. So, look, that on paper is an easier non-conference slate. A more, I'll use this word. It's a manageable non-conference slate, I think, even for a young team, because you want them to experience some tough games, go on the road like they're doing against Illinois, the uh, the two games in the Barclay Center, big environment, right? Good teams, name brand teams. Certainly will be a lot of Syracuse fans there, so it's a good mix. Whereas last year, it felt like it was just too tough for this team, and they were way behind the eight ball before they got to ACC play, and then they went 9-11 and in ACC play and had Jim Beheim's first losing season. So a lot of intrigue, though. A lot of intrigue, a lot of talent. Uh, Judah Mintz is very competitive. He can get to the basket. Justin Taylor, I think, is going to – it's going to take some time for him to get comfortable, uh, whether he plays the two or the three, whatever. I mean, he could play the two if needed, but he's mixing in at the three with Chris Bell. Um, Bell did not shoot well the other night. There's some talent there, though. Uh, I haven't talked a lot about Mal- Malik Brown. We haven't seen a ton of him, but, you know, I'm curious to see what he brings to the table. And then just what Joe can do. Can he average 20 points a game? Yes, but he's going to get so much defensive attention. We mentioned how important it is for Jesse to continue to develop Benny's improvement, right? So there's a lot that's got to happen in a short period of time for that team before ACC play kicks in. Uh, Is this a tournament team is the big question. Jim Beheim thinks so. It was funny. I was rewatching his media day press conference, and you know he was just like, nobody ever asked me that. If, if we're going to make the tournament, it's just never been like a straight up question before the season started. And of course the answer is you think your team's going to make the tournament, that they will make the tournament, any good team in, you know, whatever you want to call it, the top 50, the top 100 thinks they're going to make the tournament. Right. But that's not such a given anymore. They had a losing season last year. And even the teams that made the tournament from about 2015 on here, the last time they missed the tournament due to uh, their by choice, remember they took themselves out of the tournament with NCAA sanctions looming. And, you know, uh, those NCAA sanctions turned out to be bogus as it is, but that's all different topic uh, of conversation for another day. They barely get in in 2016, make a deep tournament, run, right? They barely get in in 2018, make a deep tournament. Run. Got in comfortably in 2019, and I think they lost in the first round, if I'm not mistaken, early, though, to Baylor. Uh, no tournament in 2020, um, and on we go, right? So when they get in, they make it worthy, a Sweet 16 to follow after that in 2021. When they get in, they seemingly make it worth it. But they have gotten in by the hair on their chinny chin chin more often than not in recent years. But the point is to just get in. So is the bottom line, just make the darn tournament, right? Is this a tournament team is going to be the question as we go, because we found out the answer to that question relatively quickly last year, even a non-conference play didn't look like a tournament team. It didn't seem like a tournament team, and it certainly didn't turn out to be a tournament team as well. Um, We'll focus more on the women's team going forward as well. That's a really interesting squad. There's only four players back from last year. Um, Felicia Leggett Jack has just put a surge of energy, positivity, fight on, as she always says. And that was so important for her to come in 
and reestablish interest and relevance and frankly, positive feelings around the program after what happened with Coach Q. Last year was kind of a weird in-between season, losing year. Vaughn Reed, we all knew, was just kind of keeping that seat warm for Felicia Leggett, Jack. So I think the approval rating is off the charts for the coach and the player she brought in, notably Daisha Fair, who was one of the best players in the country from Buffalo, who played for Buffalo. There's just a lot of guards on that team. They have nine guards and three forwards. I don't even think they have a listed center on that roster, so they're going to have to score in bunches. Um, they'll, they're going to push the pace, and they'll be intriguing to watch too. <clears throat> Pardon me. So it's a great time of year. Football is still very much in the conversation and has a chance to still have a special season, even with the loss to Clemson. Basketball has entered the chat both men's and women's fall sports in Syracuse have been great this year. The men's soccer team won the Atlantic division in the ACC. They're top five in the country. The women's team has had a good year. Hockey's getting underway. Women's ice hockey. Um, I think cross country's doing well. And, and um, I, I know a bunch of those teams up there at, at field hockey as, as I think had top 25 team all year. So fall sports have been humming up at Syracuse for sure. And it'll be humming at the JMA Wireless Dome Saturday when the Orange take on Notre Dame. That's another noon kickoff. So make sure you're right back here on all these same channels, except the basketball channel. We won't turn that on for football postgame. But Saturday after the game, about 3-ish, 3, 3, 3.30, whenever that game's over, we'll be right here on the Syracuse Orange football Facebook page, on Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube, on Twitter as well, bringing you live postgame coverage. We do that after every game, so come on by. If you do miss the show live, it archives on all these same channels, and you can find it on our social media channels as well. Your comments and um, instant reaction to Syracuse and Notre Dame. Welcome, as always. That's when we'll meet again. Thanks for hanging with us today, though, on Orange Weekly, presented by Kraus Health. You guys have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you after the Orange take on the Irish on Saturday at the Dome.